Many preppers store food in the form of rice, beans, and ramen. But then what? Many get stumped at this point, and their inventories are a hodgepodge of things they probably wouldn't eat or cook unless it was an emergency. 72-hour kits and number 10 cans of freeze-dried foods are great, but they can be challenging to use and expensive. They're also a bulky item if you need to bug out in a hurry. This video will cover about 16 different foods divided into their main nutritional categories. You should have a pound of each item of them in your prepper inventory, and I'll tell you the reasons why. And now you may already have a couple of them. You may even have all of them, but you might not have them in the forms I'm gonna discuss here. We're gonna go far beyond beans, rice, and ramen. These are going to be staples that will get you through, and they're light enough that you could carry several days of food for several people in one backpack. You could sow a whole new crop with some of them and feed an entire community. Here's what you should stock up on before disaster strikes. Download the Start Preparing Survival Guide to help you prepare for any disaster. I'll post a link in the description and comments section below or visit cityprepping.com forward slash get started for a free guide to help you get started on your journey of preparedness. Fats. Fats are an essential to good health. For fats, some of the best, most portable are tallow, lard, ghee, and Crisco. Ghee will have a shelf life of about a year, and you can easily make it at home from quality butter. Crisco is good for at least about two years. Lard is only suitable for about six months at room temperature. Now that being said, there are a few things to know about these fats. If you were to put any of them in a plastic bag and submerge them in a cool or a cold stream by weighing them down with a rock, you could safely come back to it years later and it would probably still be pristine. The other thing to know about these fats is that you will know by smell, taste, or color when they turn rancid. You can still use them as oil for lamps, spread on cloth or skins to make a water barrier, or a moisturizer. You could also use these oils to make soap if you can get your hands on some hardwood ash or lye. More than likely, you will need these fats to cook. My suggestion is to get some extra clean tallow and then boiling water bath can it. Keep it sealed and untouched. It could probably last a lot longer than you think. Protein. When we think of protein, another essential for the body, most people think of meats like beef and chicken. Some preppers approach the need for proteins by stockpiling pinto beans. Both are excellent sources of protein. The problem is that after any prolonged disaster aftermath, sources of animal meat protein will be scarce. Hunting resources will be highly competitive. And let's be honest, if you aren't accustomed to eating a cup of pinto beans a day, with the 41 grams of protein in there, your body's gonna reject those beans because of the 30 grams of soluble and insoluble fiber. Most of us are not willing to turn to insects for food except in the direst of situations. None of these mentioned protein sources, except for the beans, are very easily transported. That said, having freeze-dried meats and raw dry beans are essential to your survival stash. I will recommend a few protein sources you might not have considered. Dehydrated or freeze-dried peas contain more protein and fiber than pinto beans, and they also take up less space. One cup of dried split peas will provide you with almost 2,000 milligrams of potassium, 119 grams of carbs, 16 grams of sugar, and 48 grams of protein. They will last for three years at normal room temperature. Vacuum seal, freeze-dry, or seal them with some oxygen absorbers to extend the shelf life way out. Also, a legume but different lentils fit this category. Copious amounts of protein and a good shelf life make these a must-have. For another protein source with an even lighter weight, I suggest mushrooms. Some people don't like mushrooms. If you're not one of those people, know that one cup of raw mushrooms will have over 300 milligrams of potassium and 3 grams of protein. When it comes to fiber though, it's also going to have just 3 grams of fiber. That might not give you the feeling of fullness that beans will, but pound for pound, it will provide you with great protein without the fiber bomb. Add to this that once dehydrated or freeze-dried, you can power the mushrooms up and pack copious amounts in a tiny container. One cup of dried powdered mushrooms is the equivalent of four pounds of fresh mushrooms. That's gonna have 50 grams of protein, 30 grams of sugar, 60 grams of carbohydrates, and 5,770 milligrams of potassium in it. It is also, I remind you, a cup. Imagine how set you would be with one sealed 16 ounce container of mushroom powder. It would be one pound in your pack, but it would be 10 pounds of fresh mushrooms. I'm not gonna even try to do the math on that. I will tell you that eating it is as easy as mixing in some hot water, a stew, or even flour to bake bread. The final protein I suggest here is amaranth. 
Learn what it looks like in the wild. Amaranth is native to North America and Central America, but it is now grown as a decorative flower worldwide. It has been cultivated as a grain for at least 8,000 years. The actual positive with this grain is how all around balanced it is. One cup will give you protein, manganese, magnesium, phosphorus, iron, selenium, copper, and more. It contains antioxidants, it's gluten free, and you can powder it for an alternative flour. A 24 ounce bag of amaranth organic untreated and sproutable will provide you with a crop of it under the right conditions. Pound for pound and beyond just the protein considerations, having some of this stored with preservation in mind would allow you to restart a culture to rival the Aztecs. Amaranth was their staple. Sugars. Did you ever drop a bag of sugar and have it break open on you or spill a bunch on the counter? You have to have sugar and having it in granular form is excellent too, but I suggest you take it a step further with preservation in mind. Convert at least part of your inventory into sugar rocks or rock candy. You can easily smash it in between two rocks back to its fine form. You can dissolve it into a simple syrup by just letting it sit in some water. However, what these sugar rocks provide you is portability, less acceptability to spillage, and they are far less likely to be carried off by ants. If ants get into your granular sugar, they'll form a train and haul it away and infest all your other food in the area. You could eat ants if you had to, but you'll likely not get as much from them as you would the sugar they have stolen from you. In a rock form, the ants can't make off with all your sugar. Technically, sugar never spoils. While it's recommended that granulated sugar be discarded after two years, chances are it will still serve its baking purposes even beyond that. To make your sugar into rock, bring a cup or two of water to a boil. Add in sugar. Keep adding in sugar until it won't dissolve anymore. Don't let it burn or change color, but keep it at a low heat on until it passes from milky to clear. Then try and add more sugar, a little at a time. When the granules no longer dissolve, Pour the liquid into a 9 by 12 or similar glass baking dish and place it in a 320 degree oven. It has to get above 310 to harden to a rock candy state. After 5 to 10 minutes at this temperature, pour into molds. Here I have some soap bar silicon molds that will work nicely for this. After they cool, I can easily extract the sugar bars. Each one is about 4 ounces, so each will break down into about half a cup. You can store them in a mason jar or a mylar bag. Large amounts of sugar can be stored easily in rock form. Hard candies are also a great source of instant sugar for the same reason, and these rock candies are essentially the same. Finally, you have to get some honey in your inventory. Honey has no shelf life, so as long as you keep it from exposure to air. Honey is hygroscopic, so it will pull moisture out of the air, become thinner, and eventually reach a point where wild yeast in the air can move about within it. Add a little water to it, and wild yeast in the air we'll be able to ferment it into a meat of about 6 to 9% alcohol content. If properly sealed, however, it will harden and crystallize with time. Applying a little heat will restore it to its liquid state. Honey, because it has such a low moisture content of just 17%, doesn't allow bacteria or anything else to grow. It has been directly applied to wounds for thousands of years to form a protective barrier and speed up healing. When it comes to sugars, go beyond granulated sugars. Get some solid rocks of sugar in your inventory and some honey. These sugars will outlive you or provide you with the necessary sugars to keep moving and survive. Carbohydrates Many people only have dried beans or pasta in their inventory for carbohydrates. The next level is to store cereal grain berries. Wild harvested grains have been a food source for people since prehistoric times, and domestic cultivation of grains began more than 10,000 years ago. Cyril gets its name from Ceres, the ancient Roman goddess of agriculture, and grain crops like wheat and wheat berries are the typical prepper store grain. In their berry form, they are less susceptible to degradation, so they will keep much longer. In their berry form, the unprocessed kernel is very hard. If you have unprocessed grain kernels in your supplies, you want to make sure you have the means to grind them. Either a hand mill, purling machine, or a mortar and pestle is required to pound and grind them down. Alternatively, you could sprout them by soaking them in water to soften them and cook them. You may also sow a grass crop as you reestablish yourself in a new location since they are basically seeds. Pay special attention to your storage method to protect from insects, moisture, oxygen, and rodents. The food I recommend in the carbohydrates category is corn. While a can of corn will have a maximum shelf life of about five years, dehydrated corn adequately sealed 
in an oxygen-free environment will extend that shelf life out to 10 years. It's easier to eat if you have freeze-dried corn, but the shelf life goes out to 25 years or more when properly stored. The nice thing about freeze-drying is that you can make cornmeal by crunching it in your fingers. Mix one cup of this cornmeal with a pinch or two of salt, half to three quarters cup of boiling water, and about two tablespoons of any fat from bacon grease to butter to tallow, and you have a skillet batter called a hoe cake in the south. It was named this because it is often mixed up on the drier side, flattened into a pancake, and cooked over a fire on the flat metal piece of a hoe or shovel. Some people add a little sugar or baking soda to give it sweetness and rise. You may not have popcorn in your inventory, but you should. The reason popcorn pops is that the outer shell of the kernel is so hard and uncracked. When the corn inside converts its moisture to gas and steam, it explodes out of the shell and creates a familiar popcorn we all know so well. It is this hard shell, however, which will help to preserve your corn. You can simmer in water popcorn kernels for a few hours and then bring it to a boil. The long, slow simmer will crack the shell and ruin the explosive nature of the grain. Add a little soda ash or hardwood ash into it while it cooks, then rinse well, and you'll be able to make a type of masa for tortillas out of it by simply mixing in some lard to the paste. If that's all too much work, you can just smash it into cornmeal between two rocks and cook it in the cornbread. Is that still too much work? If it is, make it in the popcorn. Popcorn will provide you with good carbohydrates, fiber, and will fill you up fast. Whatever you do, get a few pounds or more of popcorn in your inventory and go beyond canned corn. It will last much longer than regular corn grain because it is less acceptable to absorbing moisture. I can't leave the carbohydrate category without also mentioning hardtack and sunchokes. I have a video on each one of these and I'll link to it in the comments below. The hardtack has a hundred or more years of shelf life and you can smash it back down to flour and make bread if you have to. The sunchokes will provide you with unlimited source of carbohydrates. Both will keep you alive long after disaster has struck. Salts. Your body will use salt to balance fluids in the blood and maintain healthy blood pressure and it is also essential for nerve and muscle function. The electrical impulses that fire off in your neurons and muscles, like your heart and diaphragm all, depend on salt. Without salt, you will die. Granulated salt is excellent, and insects won't carry it away like they will your sugar. If you spill it though, or it gets a splash of water, you lose it all. I highly recommend following a similar procedure for making rock candy out of sugar. The significant difference between the two procedures is that the salt doesn't need to be heated beyond 320 degrees as the sugar does. You will want a mold, and you don't need to achieve any specific temperature with salt. If you can't wait for the natural evaporation, you can place the salt in a mold in a 300 degree oven, and the water will evaporate off. Pack the salt tightly into a waterproof container. If they get splashed with water, they're still okay. You can smash it between rocks to get it back to find salt or you can just throw a small salt rock in whatever you're cooking. When it comes to salt, a little bit is all you need, but you also need it for preserving foods, brining, pickling, and drying meats. You may need just a little, but you do need it. Don't rely on granulated salt only, but carry around a few salt rocks as well. Just don't mix them in with your rock candy. Here also I have to include bouillon cubes. They're extremely salty, but will allow you to quickly impart chicken, beef, and other flavors to your food. Even in the absence of actual chicken, having the taste will help you make other foods more palatable while also providing you with essential salts. A bouillon cube has a typical best life of about two years, but I have used it for years and years beyond two years. If that's all you have to survive on, you could still get a few days out of a few cubes. If you can forage for some plants to add to your broth, you can stretch it much, much further. Sprouts and microgreens. At the risk of sounding like a hippie, I have to tell you that sprouts and microgreens can feed you for months on less than a pound. This is a half cup of unsprouted lentil beans just four days later. The nutrition I could have put in here to rival any of the categories mentioned earlier. It has protein, but complex and easily digestible proteins, so it's better for you. It has vitamins, minerals, nutrients, and enzymes only fresh plants can provide. Many attest that sprouts are more easily digestible as its seed germination breaks down some indigestible components and heightens the nutritional value. The difference between sprouts and microgreens is the stage of life. You let a sprout grow a bit more, maybe adding some soil to it, and you have a microgreen. The leaves and stems of the microgreen are what you consume. Ponder this fact. 
There are about 199,000 alfalfa seeds per pound. You could sow an acre filled with that. You could eat the sprouts. You could powder the dry seeds. The fact is that one pound of dry sprout seeds will serve you amazingly well. You don't even need light to get them to sprout. These are so important that I'll be doing a follow-up video just on these. So please consider subscribing to this channel for when that is released. For our purposes here, know that a pound or more of seeds saved in a sprouting container and placed in a bug out bag will feed a small family for a very, very long time. Alertness. While not a nutritional powerhouse, I have to include teas in your must have foods. Basic caffeinated tea leaves will provide you with a level of alertness and awakeness, as well as some tannins and a few trace minerals. The caffeine and warm tea will help with hunger pangs. Herbal teas have some medicinal qualities as well. Tea can be supplemented with forage items like pine needles and mullein. Tea leaves, once boiled, though to make tea, you should boil it, can be used as a poultice on wounds. Many teas have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. This is also where the tannins come into play. Tannins can improve wound healing, reduce scarring, and prevent bacterial growth. So, though I have teas in the alertness category, they are so much more to you. All you risk is consuming tea past its expiration date is quality when it comes to shelf life. You don't get sick from drinking expired tea. Consider what a compressed one pound block of tea leaves could do for you, then get it in your inventory. That's it. If you get one pound of each food I mentioned here, your pack would weigh just about 16 pounds, but you could feed a small group for several weeks. You could provide yourself with some hunting and foraging added in for several months. With any of these items, the more tightly packed, oxygen and moisture free the foods are, the longer shelf life you'll get out of them. You could sow acres of crops in that one pack, make soap, broth, and even cornbread out of popcorn. Think of your food stores in terms of these seven to 10 pounds. Realize the maximum potential of these food sources. With just 10 compressed blocks or cans of vacuum sealed bags of these, you could be eating well long beyond any disaster. The great thing about these is the cost versus value and utility. For a few dollars, you could be well supplied and highly mobile. What do you think? What's your nutritional powerhouse that's lightweight, but will fuel you mightily through a disaster? Let us know in the comments below. I try to read me in the comments and respond to them when I can. That's typically within the first hour of releasing a video. The only way to be notified when I release a follow-up video specifically on sprouts and microgreens is by subscribing to this channel. If you enjoy this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. As always, stay safe out there.